Right, well, good morning to everyone again. Uh, it's me again, um, and today I'm going to talk about um, biomolecular thermodynamics and calorimetry, but predominantly focusing on the technique of ITC. Um, can someone just type in the Q&A, one of the attendees, that you can hear me okay and my volume level is uh, okay? Great, okay, thank you very much. So, the talk is going to be divided roughly in half into um, a discussion about biological thermodynamics and in the second half about biological calorimetry. Now, both of these areas are absolutely enormous topics and um, I'm only going to kind of dip into the areas for the benefit of um, showing you what um, facilities are available within biophysics in terms of calorimetric facilities. Um, I will try and keep within an hour, although I'm already going on, um, uh, but just bear with me. I'm not going to talk for two hours, definitely, but there's certainly material here to give two talks. Okay, I can't advance my slide. Okay, so um, here in the LMB, um, this slide sort of summarizes pretty well everything that people are are interested in. Uh, obviously, I may have left out some areas, um, but you can see that um, we have a very much protein centric view of the world and we're interested in the way these proteins behave. We may be interested in how they're synthesized, how they fold, what the mechanism is for their folding, and whether they need any assistance in this folding process using chaperones, for example, we might be interested in how they interact with other molecules such as um, nucleic acids or membranes or small molecules, for example. And equally, we might be interested very much in a structural mode of um, looking at how these proteins form large macromolecular complexes. We may like them to form very ordered arrays so we could obtain crystals. Um, and uh, we may be also interested in how they undergo some sort of uh, polymerization um, and association to form very extended uh, macromolecular polymers, in particular amyloid, etc. Um, and the important thing um, to take home from this um, is that all of the biology here that we're interested in is based about, uh, around a reversible equilibrium process. That's because it's mediated and consolidated by predominantly non-covalent interactions, um, which are individually weak in strength, but um, when they come together in large numbers, um, we can generate these unique structures. So what do we really mean by, mean by um, equilibrium? Sorry, my... Uh, printer was just making a lot of noise there. Um, so what do we really mean by this um, term equilibrium in a biological equilibrium? And just as an example, we can think about the equilibrium for protein folding or protein DNA binding. So at chemical equilibrium, um, this um, um, state or the, the, these states have come to um, an equilibrium and there's no net change in the concentration of either um, um, state within this equilibrium. And the reaction position or where we are in terms of where we are in terms of um, how much we have, which is going to give us a biological effect, can easily be described by an equilibrium constant or is described by that. And this is just simply the ratio of the concentrations of the products over the reaction, uh, reactants. Um, and these concentrations are ultimately determined by the ratio of the forward and the reverse um, rates for these reactions. So for this protein folding, we have an equilibrium constant, which is the ratio of, in this case, the denatured concentration over the native concentration. And that's reflected in the ratio of the rates for this process. It becomes a bit more complicated um, for a bimolecular interaction as concentration then becomes part of the um, um, 
equilibrium. But in principle, it's the same. And these are defined by um, this equilibrium position will be defined by the ratio of these uh, rates. So um, people um, often get a bit worried about uh, thermodynamics um, and uh, find it a very unpleasant um, area or subject. But um, in reality, it's not really that complicated. And you probably heard of the Gibbs free energy. And basically all this is, is a logarithmic uh, representation of the equilibrium position. So you can see the Gibbs energy is equal to minus RT times the log of this equilibrium constant. And this free energy has components of um, enthalpy and entropy, which are designated with delta H and delta S. And I'm going to describe in a bit more detail what they are. And the important thing in terms of what we understand from thinking about the Gibbs free energy is when it's negative, then the log of this equilibrium constant must be positive. So that means that the equilibrium constant must be greater than one. And therefore, under those conditions, the products are in excess. Um, depending on how you're looking at the reaction, in this case, um, for an association constant, that the product would be this um, ternary complex here of DNA and protein. And just as an interesting back of the envelope kind of calculation, you can see that if um, the equilibrium constant changes by an order of magnitude, a factor of 10, this would give a change um, in, in log of 2.3. And at 298, RT is 0.59 kilocals per mole. So this is equal to a change in free energy of about 1.4 kilocals per mole. Okay, so that always gives you a very useful way of sort of um, understanding in when you're talking about changes in free energy, um, how much you've actually shifted the equilibrium constant. So what are enthalpy and entropy? And this is a very simplified view on the whole system. So um, the enthalpy of um, a biomolecular system um, is equal to the internal energy um, under a constant pressure situation. And systems will naturally want to progress to a lower energy um, or lower internal energy level. And they would like to lower their enthalpy. Hot things don't remain hot in a, in a cold environment, they lose heat. And so when, sorry, when the change in um, enthalpy is negative and heat is given off by the reaction in so-called exothermic reaction, then this means that the equilibrium product is favored. As well as this um, um, process, the systems or the biomolecular system will want to find more ways of configuring with the same energy or more disorder. And this is purely just a statistical process. So the more ways there are of achieving a particular outcome, then the more probable is that outcome. And you can think about that simply in the way of, for example, throwing a number of dice, the numbers that can be produced by multiple combinations of numbers will be more probable. And temperature is going to modulate this probability effect through thermal motion or through Brownian motion. And this is why in the equation we have temperature in here um, with the entropy. Um, and it's the, then the difference between the enthalpy and the entropy, um, which is leading to where our equilibrium position is going to end up. In these schematics, you can think about enthalpy as being a vertical dimension and entropy here in this to sort of funnel view um, is the horizontal dimension. So the molecules under Brownian mo um, or, or fueled by Brownian motion would tend to find more ways of ordering with the same um, energy system. And so entropy is a measure of the number of ways of arranging the system. And when it is positive, there are more ways, obviously. And therefore, again, the equilibrium product is favored. So that's because we have negative T delta S. So that term becomes negative and delta G be itself becomes more negative. So where does our biological equilibrium end up? Well, it's simply the balance of the enthalpy and the temperature entropy that leads to delta G. And this is what's going to define the equilibrium position. 
Obviously, temperature is a key factor in where the equilibrium is going to end up because we have this T delta S term. And another point is that um, a favorable uh, delta G um, can be obtained even when one component is unfavorable. So you don't have to have both enthalpy and entropy in a favorable um, direction to uh, see a reaction progress, providing the other term is um, favorable and larger. You can see this here on this schematic that the equilibrium will proceed towards products or towards whatever we're considering, um, even in areas where the entropy change is unfavorable. For example, you can think about that simply in terms of protein folding. Um, there must be fewer ways for a folded protein to arrange with the same energy level than an unfolded protein. So one would imagine that the entropy change for protein folding is pretty unfavorable. However, because of all of the um, interactions that form within a protein, we have a large entropy and that's bigger than this entropic unfavorable term. So uh, we've talked about enthalpy and entropy and are these fixed values? Can we just think of them as some number and we have to consider them for our biological reaction? Well, unfortunately not, or rather interestingly not, because in biological equilibria, there can be, and often is, changes in conformation, for example, in folding, but also during interactions, we can see changes in um, confirmation, and also large changes in molecular solvation, i.e. water, how water interacts with our protein um, or system of interest. And both of these will affect the, the um, heat capacity of the system. The heat capacity is very simply the energy that you need to put into the system to increase its temperature by one degree Kelvin and it has units of calories per mole, per mole per degree. Biological reactions that we're interested in generally have a large change in heat capacity. So the point with heat capacity is that the integral of, of heat capacity gives us the enthalpy. So if we think about raising a system from zero Kelvin up to some temperature, then the amount of energy that we've had to put in, the energy needed to increase its temperature from zero Kelvin up to the temperature of interest is giving it the internal energy. So the integral of the heat capacity is equal to the enthalpy. And in terms of the entropy, um, it's the Cp divided by the T. So, this represents the energy levels for the system. And because of this significant delta Cp for biological equilibria, the corresponding enthalpy and entropy, and therefore also the free energy, which is just the difference between the two, they all become temperature dependent. Um, and delta S and delta G become temperature dependent in a non-linear manner. So here you can see the enthalpy is gonna vary in a linear manner. Um, in proportion to the Cp, while the entropy has this logarithmic term, so therefore it will be nonlinear. So we can think about how this affects um, free energy um, as an example in, in during thermal denaturation. So now we're just thinking about um, what happens if we heat up this protein and it um, becomes unfolded. Um, obviously, this will apply in terms of temperature and any free energy measure. So it also applies in terms of um, the free energy of biological interaction. So the large changes in heat capacity, heat capacity generate free energy that has marked curvature. So here you can see what I've done is just simulate some data with a TM of uh, 320 Kelvin. And um, I've simulated this using different levels of heat capacity, but with a fixed enthalpy of about of 50 kilocals per mole. And what you can see is as the heat capacity change for this, this equilibrium, so we're talking about a heat capacity change between the folded and the denatured state, becomes progressively bigger, the free energy function develops more and more curvature. 
what we see is there's a maxima in the free energy function and this corresponds to where the entropy between the process is equal to zero. That's because the derivative of uh, free energy with respect to temperature is equal to the negative of the entropy. Uh, but below this temperature where we have the maxima, a zone of destabilization with decreasing temperature occurs. And this actually suggests a temperature at which we can unfold the protein again just by making it cold. And this is often called cold denaturation temperature or um, TC here. And so in principle, proteins have two uh, melting temperatures, one at low temperature and one at high temperature. Under these conditions where the delta CP is quite small, we don't see that um, melting cold denaturation temperature under a range where water would remain as a liquid, so the sample would freeze. But what the point is, is that the larger the delta CP for a particular enthalpy, then the more curvature and the higher is this melting uh, cold denaturation temperature. So this has some consequences, and I mentioned this as a slight detour from the main theme of the talk, but interfaces in biomolecular complexes may well be low enthalpy because they're stabilized by few interactions, but they may well have fairly high delta CP changes because there are conformational changes or changes in solvation. And in fact, cold inactivation of many multimeric enzymes at four degrees C is, is pretty well documented. And you can look back at this paper, which is um, quite historic now, but here's a table from the paper that um, lists out a lot of glycolytic enzymes. And the observation is that when you cool them down, um, they, uh, these, these multi um, subunit enzymes dissociate and become inactive. The other point that I mentioned, or the other reason that I'm mentioning it is just out of intellectual interest, but in terms of um, adaptation um, for thermophilic organisms, where they want their TM perhaps to be more like 100 degrees C, you can see that by modulating the enthalpy here, we generate a system where the stability at the temperature, say, where the organism may want to live, um, which is, say, round about here, maybe the um, free energy may be biased at too high a level. And obviously, biology wants free energies to be in uh, at moderate levels so that molecules can be turned over things interact and then they come apart again, et cetera. And so very high free energies or very high biases are um, the kind of um, events that you see for pretty well ir irreversible processes. If we don't change the thermodynamics at all, then we end up with a very elevated cold denaturation temperature, which may be problematic. This is our starting point in black. And actually the best strategy in terms of extending your range where you can be biologically viable um, and still have a reasonable free energy is to lower the delta CP for the process. So I just mentioned that as, a, a, as an interesting aside. So other than temperature um, and delta CP, can anything else affect delta G? Well, actually, a lot of things can affect um, the equilibrium position. And this originates out of the law of mass action, which um, is sometimes known as Le Chatelier's principle, proposed by this um, chap um, chemist here. And it, he originally stated it as when a system at dynamic equilibrium is disturbed, the equilibrium position will shift in the direction which tends to minimize or counteract the effect of, uh, of the disturbance. And obviously that doesn't really seem like it has, has much use in biology, but when you think about it, when we're um, interested, for example, in two proteins coming together, there are going to be PKAs um, in these two proteins which will change on complex formation because the ionizable groups are um, become uh, um, in different environments or they're involved in interactions um, with other charge groups and this shifts their peak pKa. Thus the equilibrium position changes so when we go from uh, the molecules not bound to the molecules bound 
we're generating protons. So if we didn't have buffer present, then potentially the pH would change. Um, but the fact that the equilibrium position changes technically the proton concentration means through mass action, this cause and effect, that proton concentration or pH will affect the equilibrium position. So this is why, because of these shifts in pKa, we generate um, um, functions where a property of our system changes as a function of, PK, uh, of pH. And it's only in situations where there are absolutely no pKa shifts in an equilibrium that we would have no pH dependence in the equilibrium position. So here's another example of mass, or a couple of examples, more examples of mass action. In this case, if we think about an oligomeric system where we have a tetramer, and when we unfold that tetramer, it generates four unfolded monomers. So the equilibrium position is going to change the concentration of molecules because one mole of this will generate um, the, an equivalent of four moles of the monomer. Therefore, the equilibrium, or the, which is the stability or the melting temperature of this tetramer, will depend on its concentration. Similarly, um, and we've heard last week um, about um, discussions about thermal shift assays, which is looking at ligands that bind to proteins they tend to increase their TM. And this is coming simply from uh, a mass action effect. The equilibrium in, uh, involves changes in binding of the ligand. Therefore, the equilibrium, which is the position between the um, um, unbound and the bound, um, will depend on the concentration of the ligand shown in red. So what about biological calorimetry? How do we measure enthalpy? Um, well, under constant pressure, the heat that's transferred during a process is the enthalpy. And a calorimeter, um, and if you just look at the definition of the word, calor means heat and metrum means measure. And thus, um, this technique will measure directly the enthalpy of a biological or process of interest. So calorimetry is potentially extremely useful in that the signal in a calorimeter is the heat of a process and the change in enthalpy, which is uh, we've already discussed, is a direct measurement of one of the driving forces for biological equilibria that we're interested in, the enthalpy here. But calorimetry also has a number of other advantages because we're able to determine the values of T delta S if we measure delta G or we measure the equilibrium position and we measure the enthalpy. So once we've determined the um, um, equilibrium position, we get the free energy. Once we've measured the enthalpy, we know everything else except T delta S. So we can evaluate the, the uh, level of entropy. We're not measuring entropy, we're determining it by exclusion. Um, calorimetry is also an extremely general method. Pretty well all biological equilibria you can think of will have an associated enthalpy. So that includes conformational transitions, melting of biomolecules, binding of biomolecules, interactions um, between biomolecules or between organelles, membranes, viruses, and also enzymology, turnover, and catalysis. And in all of these methods, we don't need to develop any particular assay or have any colorimetrically based um, um, assay. Um, it's very direct in that the heat is coming directly from the, um, from the process. So it's a non-optical method and it's label free as a result. Um, we don't need any specific groups or labels and we can also use optically turbid suspensions, or we could look at crude extracts. Uh, we can use unusual solvents with high backgrounds of other molecules and um, crude extracts for it. And so it's applicable to many, many systems from a molecular level up to a cellular level. So long as you can get the material into your calorimeter, then you can in principle measure processes that are going on in it. So calorimetry was actually one of the earliest scientific techniques that was reported in the literature. 
Um, and here in the middle is a diagram of um, Lavoisier's ice calorimeter um, from the 1780s. And he used it, um, in his case, his biological system was a guinea pig. The guinea pig went into the calorimeter and he demonstrated that um, the guinea pig produced an equivalent, equivalent amount of carbon dioxide um, as when you combusted um, carbon to generate carbon dioxide. And he measured how much heat was being given off by the carbon and the guinea pig by um, looking at the amount of water that was um, coming out as the ice inside the calorimeter melted. There are lots of other types of calorimeter in the world. You may have come across these kind of coffee cup calorimeters back in um, earlier schooling days. Um, here's um, so an area of calorimetry where people are interested in um, combustion or fire calorimetry. So people need to know how much heat is evolved when you burn a um, furniture in an office. Looks like quite a good experiment to do. Um, and then down here we have um, um, so a, a picture of the Atlas calorimeter, which is at the Large Hadron Collider. So calorimetry occurs in all areas of science, um, physics, chemistry, biology, a very useful technique. So in terms of biocalorimetry, which is what we're interested in, well, we can imagine that the heat, the enthalpy from a typical protein-protein interaction might be on the order of 10 kilocals per mole. And so if we have 50 nanomoles of our protein that, or our system of interest, which would correspond to one mil of a 50 micromolar solution, this is going to only give off uh, about five times 10 to the minus four calories of heat upon binding or interacting. And this based on the latent heat um, of um, melting of ice will generate six micrograms of ice or uh, heat the water up by about five times 10 to the minus four of a degree. In this case, conventional direct heat transfer calorimetry is not possible. Um, and this is a conventional, uh, or this is a heat transfer type of calorimeter. So this is not going to work. Here's Lavoisier and his wife. Um, he looks slightly um, perturbed maybe in that his ice calorimeter can't be uh, used for biological instruments. Um, or it may also be that um, he actually eventually was um, faced the guillotine during the French Revolution. <laughs> Um, so uh, that was for his connection with money, I should add, not for his science. He was also a tax collector, uh, which was not popular. So what we have to do is use a different kind of calorimeter for bio biological systems, and it's known as a power compensation um, calorimeter. What we do is we have two cells, uh, one of which is containing the sample where things are going on. The other is a reference that basically contains um, solvent um, or the solvent that we're using um, for our biological experiment. What we do is we measure the difference in temperature using a very precise thermopile. And this difference is kept constant using these main feedback heaters uh, which are looking, which are linked into this um, difference in temperature circuitry. Then there's um, a very uh, small or a fine um, additional feedback um, heater on the sample cell, and this is used to finally trim the difference between the uh, in temperature between the two cells in this feedback loop um, to keep it at a constant value. And this um, additional power that we're putting into the sample cell comes out, and this is basically our measured signal, which is going to give us our enthalpy. We can measure increases or decreases in differential power if, um, in this circuit, because it's directly proportional to the excess heat taken up or given off during the reactions. So here are two types of biocalorimeter that we have in the um, LMB. We have isothermal titration calorimeters, ITC, and these study interactions 
um, at, a, at one temperature, which are induced through the titration or mixing of two systems together. They work, say, between four and 70 degrees, and we can measure um, equilibrium constants in the range of um, millimole down to about nanomole. We also have differential scanning calorimetry, which I'll mention very briefly at the end of the talk. Um, and this is used to um, study temperature induced phase transitions or melting. Um, and this can be done by increasing or decreasing the temperature. Um, and the instrument we have has a temperature range between zero and about 130 degrees C. The reason we can go above 100 degrees C is because uh, we apply a bit of excess pressure on top of the um, solutions we're studying. So this is quite useful in um, if you have a particularly thermophilic um, system that you want to look at. So here's me in my younger days um, coming into the world of calorimetry and thinking, well, I've got a, I've got a structure here and I can see some interactions between these two proteins and I want to improve the affinity. I want to make a drug or something like that. But and I can measure directly the um, thermodynamics of this process. And so therefore I can easily manipulate um, the energies directly. The problem with this kind of thought and the thought of um, um, sort of scientific greatness is that when we measure the heat or the enthalpy of a process, it is a global and non-specific probe. And so calorimeters are going to measure the totality of heat effects from all changes in a system. And this may well include um, changes that you can visualize um, in a cryo EM structure or an X-ray or NMR um, structure, but it will also include contributions from changes in solvation of the system shifts in PKAs that are not easy to see, leading to changes in protonation and also changes in dynamics in the system. And so the fact that um, enthalpy contains all these contributions really emphasizes um, the combination of molecular forces that are driving interactions in, in, in biology and in particular in solution. And these are not resolved in structures and are often forgotten or ignored. And I think I tried to make that point in the um, talk about single molecule spectroscopy um, at the end of last week. So I reiterate that. So it's all about interactions in solution. We can consider these two molecules coming together and the interacting interfaces will be solvated by water here. And when the molecules come together, the water is effectively displaced and released back into the bulk solvent. And in the bulk solvent, it will have different energetic properties. So when we look at the observed enthalpy that we could measure in a calorimeter, it will have contributions from the um, direct interaction or the changes in internal energy in these biological molecules, but it will also have contributions from changes to this water system. And similarly, um, in buffer, uh, we can have the case that buffers will take up or donate protons during an interaction. Um, and this will also have an associated enthalpy. Um, so in our system, when these two molecules come together, we have this charged group here, it becomes deprotonated over here. So the buffer has to take up the protons is to maintain the pH. And this process of the buffer um, going from a deprotonated to a protonated form has an associated enthalpy. So therefore, when we measure the enthalpy, it will have contributions from our interactions, our changes in solvation, and also our changes in ionization. And, and one can extend this list with other um, elements of the um, system. But one of the consequences of this is that calorimetry can actually be used to directly measure um, changes in protonation, for example, during in, uh, biological interaction. All we need to do is to measure an interaction using, for example, our ITC instrument at the same pH and salt conditions 
but using a variety of different buffers. And here are the, the ionization enthalpies of lots of different buffers from this reference here. And you can see that they vary quite a bit. Um, so if we picked um, a, a number of different buffers, measured the observed heat, then the slope of this will equal the net change in protonation going on during our reaction. Um, and if we extrapolate that to zero buffer um, um, enthalpy of ionization, we would then get the intrinsic um, enthalpy of the um, interaction between the components. So here's another slight technical aside um, in terms of what consequence that also has. And this is about buffer pH and temperature. So the buffer ionization, the processing in, in terms of ionizing this um, or protonating this buffer will have an associated enthalpy. And so going back to mass action again, this enthalpy generates heat and this heat would change the temperature. And so through mass action, temperature will shift the position of this buffer equilibrium or change the pKa of your buffer. So buffer pH will depend on temperature with the largest changes in buffer pH as a function of temperature will occur for buffers that have large ionization enthalpies. And the worst culprit is TRIS, which is often one of the most popular buffers. Uh, here you can see TRIS um, has um, a change in pH of 0 0.03 uh, units or so. So phosphate is particularly good here. You can see phosphate at 7.2. The ionization enthalpy is almost zero and therefore the change in pH is very small. There are other problems with phosphate buffer and that comes when you um, consider freezing material um, in phosphate buffer. Um, and that's because of certain salts being insoluble. Um, but TRIS buffer, for example, when you prepare TRIS buffer at 25 degrees C, it will be about 0.6 units higher at four degrees in the cold room. And it will be 1.2 pH units lower at 65 degrees C, where you may be doing some other experiments. So I just mentioned this, um, I'm sure you're all probably aware of this fact, uh, but here you have the tabulated information, quite useful. Please think about this when you're working, um, when you're um, doing experiments that are using different temperatures. So let's get on to practical biocalorimetry in the um, remainder of the talk. So I've introduced the two types of calorimeter that we have here in the LMB. I'm mainly going to talk about ITC. So in an IT, ITC experiment, we have a syringe that we can use to inject material into the sample cell. This is a power compensation type of calorimeter. So this will be the cell that where we're measuring the differential power and obtaining our enthalpy. So the ITC so-called 200 instrument is named because the active cell volume is 200 microliters. And on these types of instrument, the syringe has a volume of about 40 microliters. To load the sample cell, you need about 350 microliters and a target concentration between 10 and 50 micromolar, although this is a uh, a preliminary starting concentration, and it may be modulated later, depending on the observed results. Um, we actually consume about 275 microliters to load the cell. So you can recover about 75 microliters um, to check the concentration or, or reuse it for other experiments. In terms of the ligand, that's what we put, or what I'm going to call the um, component that's put in the syringe, we need about a concentration of 50 to 500 micromole. Um, and loading the syringe takes about 55 microliters. Um, and this will then allow us to make 15 to 20 injections of two to three microliters. So already, although I can't hear you because you're all muted, I can here you all taking a gasp of breath. So ITC is definitely a sample hungry technique. And so it's pretty useful to have evidence of binding from other techniques uh, or the literature 
um, before you embark on making ITC measurements. Um, heat is a very non-specific probe and calorimetry measures the totality of heat effects. As we've just discussed in terms of thinking about water, changes in solvent, changes in protonation, etc. And this, another consequence of this is that we often need controls, which will mean consuming more material. So when we want to think about what sort of uh, signal we might get during an ITC experiment, first of all, the simplest um, control would be just to inject buffer into buffer. And this will give us some sort of background heat of injection. And it comes because we have mechanical disturbances the um, syringe has on the end of it a paddle which is stirring the material in the cell so that we generate efficient mixing. We could also have very, very small temperature gradients as we inject from the syringe, which is um, outside the instrument into the calorimeter. So we observe some heat um, and I'll designate that with this uh, blue circle. The next kind of control we could think about doing would be to in inject buffer from the syringe into protein in the cell. This is a background heat that we measured um, in this experiment, but also with the heat of dilution of the protein. Um, and that's because we're adding buffer into the protein. There might be an associated heat with that dilution phenomena. But usually um, this dilution heat is, is minimal or effectively zero. And the reason for that is we're actually only adding in a small amount couple of microliters of buffer into 200 microliters in the cell of protein. So the concentration doesn't change that much. Um, so the dilution heat is pretty small. So then we could then think about putting the ligands that we're interested in, in the syringe and injecting that into buffer in the cell. This will give us a background heat. Again, we get the same heat as we got in the first experiment. But in addition, we'll get a heat of dilution of the ligands. And this can be significant. The dilution of the ligand is quite large. We're injecting two microliters into 200. So the concentration is going to change by a factor of 100. And then finally, we would come on to make our actual calorimetric measurements where we inject the ligand in the syringe into the protein. Uh, so we get the background heat, we get the heat of dilution of the protein and the heat of dilution of the ligand. But in addition, we get this heat of binding designated by the red, and this is what we're interested in, okay? This is what we're trying to measure. But since we've seen here, or what I've told you is that this heat here is essentially zero. If we correct the data measured in experiment four with the data we obtain in experiment three, that's usually an adequate control. Um, so this is going to be the major correction of the data that we need to make. So here's some typical ITC data that we obtained here, um, here in the LMB. In this case, 600 micromolar peptide uh, was injected into 45 micromolar protein or into buffer. In the black trace, we have the injection of the peptide into buffer. So what we can do is integrate the excess heat this is differential power on the y-axis. When we integrate that heat, we just get, um, because this is um, time and we're measuring differential power per unit time, we end up with heat. So we get heat from each injection. And then we can plot that out um, and try and fit it. Here you can see the heats that come from the control injection, the heat of dilution. You can see that they nicely converge once the system is saturated or the protein is binding the peptide and becomes saturated. So in that case, we could subtract the control, fit the data, and we'd be happy. So quite often, we can do um, um, a single experiment without doing any controls. Um, in this case, 500 micromolar of ligand into 30 micromolar protein. And you can see here at the end of the titration, these last injections are fairly constant and of an equal um, amplitude and magnitude. So we can assume that this corresponds to the heat of dilution of our ligand um, once we've saturated the protein with ligand, all the binding sites saturated with ligand um, and therefore we're measuring the heat of dilution within the one experiment. 
So we can just evaluate these heats and take them away and then fit the data, or we could also just simply fit the data to an offset. So the calorimeters, the ITCs are all supplied with um, software that can be used to fit the data. Um, and these are, uh, well, um, either called Origin or more recently, um, there's um, new software called Peak. Um, and the most commonly used model um, is to have some number of sites with identical affinity and enthalpy. And if we fit this data here, you'll see that we, um, the data fitting will spit out these um, parameters for our um, variables, our number of sites and our um, equilibrium constant. It will give us a KD and a KA, which is simply the reciprocal of the KD. And then here's the measured enthalpy. So given this information here, we can then calculate the value of delta G from minus RT log K. We can also then evaluate the, um, the entropy change because we know the um, enthalpy and the free energy. So what do we do with the data? The first thing we do is to completely disregard these errors and the suggested precision that the so fitting software are giving us. I just find it intensely annoying that um, um, the, the software is simply giving us a least squares error and suggesting an unreasonable level of precision in our data, namely here that we could discriminate 331 nanomole or uh, 329 nanomole as a KD from our measure or our fitted value of 330. So please disregard the errors and this precision. It's also interesting to take the data. This is a somewhat unusual way of looking at binding data. It's graphed out as the molar ratio, which is the ratio of the concentration of the added ligand to the concentration of the material in the cell. Um, so that increases, um, and here you can see the inflection in the data is um, at this value of 0 0.7. So please come to talk 16 where Stephen and I will discuss um, errors and curve fitting in a, in, in a bit more um, detail. Um, some of you may be thinking, well, what's the meaning of this stoichiometry or number of sites, which is equal to 0 0.7? In this case, in this data, this is a pretty well-defined um, and well-constrained parameter. If you look at the curve fit, um, the, the error is fairly low, although obviously we would not quote it to that level of precision. So when we're quoting this value for the stoichiometry, we're making several assumptions. First, that the concentration of the macromolecules that we've used in the cell and the, and the syringe were measured correctly. We didn't make any errors when we measured the concentration and we know very precisely um, what their extinction coefficients were. We're also making the assumption that both of our components were 100% pure. We're also making another assumption is that they were 100% native or binding competent, meaning that even if we measured them very accurately and they were 100% pure, we could have 20% of our material, say, where the protein in some way was modified um, and was therefore unable to bind our ligand. So N, this um, value of N or the number of sites can be viewed alternatively as an indicator of an active binding site concentration or just more naively, uh, what we're doing is we're introducing another fitting parameter to our data that allows the concentrations that we measured to float during the fitting process. And as a result, we can generate a fit that will go exactly through our points. Um, so, however, in practice, because if one would accept some level of error in measuring concentrations of ligands and proteins in the, in, in the syringe in the cell, then um, an error of uh, around N of a, approximately 0 0.2 should be considered to be essentially showing or consistent with one-to-one -one binding. Values of N, which are 0 0.5 and 2, might have some potential physical meaning as well. For example, dimer or binding to two ligands. 
So just to give you some quick information about how you might optimize your ITC experiment, um, this type of plot where we're looking at molar ratio against um, the observed um, heat for each injection, it has different regions that um, have different information content. In the case of this um, um, system where the binding was fairly tight, we have information about the enthalpy, which is the amplitude of this um, titration in, from these early points. We have information about the affinity and stoichiometry at this point when we transition from this um, com, um, um, region here of enthalpy to the endpoint region, and then we have information about the heat of dilution of our um, ligand in the syringe at the end of the titration that we can use to correct the data with. So these kind of um, curves that are very popular in the world of um, ITC can be described by something that's known as the um, C value. And the C value is simply what the concentration of protein is in the cell divided by the KD. Okay, so it's how far you're, you are above the KD when you're making measurement. And you can see here, if you simulate data for different um, C values, that you stand the best chance of determining the KD, the N, uh, stoichiometry and the enthalpy in one experiment such as this, when the um, C value is between say five or and 500. I've got 10 here, but you can go a bit lower than that. You can see that once C goes higher than 500, you end up with a step function where there's very little definition, just as there perhaps is here of the affinity and stoichiometry. And when the C value becomes very low, um, below 10 or here one, you have a very featureless curve that approximates um, somewhat a straight line. So what do you do when you want to study high affinity binding? So as the binding becomes tighter and binding that we might be interested in is often in, in the nanomole range, the C value becomes large. And so what we would do using this um, equation would just be to reduce the protein concentration in the cell. Unfortunately, we can't do that um, um, to an unlimited extent because if you think about the cell concentration and the total enthalpy of binding a ligand to whatever's in the cell, that will determine some amount of heat and that heat is going to be released into our calorimeter um, in a few injections. Um, and um, so eventually we're unable to reduce the cell concentration to an, uh, to an extent where we can get the C value into a reasonable range. And so for straightforward ITC measurements, the KDs in the hundreds of, or so or tens to of nanomole range are doable but below that, we would not be able to do that with reasonable um, accuracy. But however, ITC is a um, non-optical method. And so it's very well set up to do competition binding, which can be used to extend the range of affinities that you can measure. So this is the binding of um, a compound KN764 um, to HIV1 protease. Um, and you can see if you do the straight ITC experiment, one is unable to determine um, the affinity other than to say it's very tight. However, if we do a preliminary titration with pepstatin, which has a much more moderate affinity, um, we do a titration, we then refill the ITC syringe with our compound of interest, titrate that in, we displace the pepstatin. Um, and we can determine very easily the KD for that interaction around about 32 picomole. And an important point to note is both the affinity is perturbed in this competition method, but also the enthalpy. So here you can see the enthalpy is negative around about eight. Um, for the binding of the um, pepstatin, uh, we have a positive enthalpy, which is unfavorable, but again, around about eight. So when we look at the displacement experiment, we see an observed enthalpy of about minus 16. This is because we have to first displace the pepstatin, which has an enthalpy of minus eight, 
and then we then bind in our compound which has an enthalpy of again minus eight so we end up with a much larger enthalpy so these effects on both enthalpy and affinity make this particularly useful um, for screening small molecules um, in a sort of moderate throughput method. So weak binding, as processes become um, weaker and the C value becomes lower, what we would do would increase um, the protein concentration. Unfortunately, um, we can't do that to an unlimited extent because we may not have the material or it may not be soluble. Um, but if we do careful background heats of dilution measurements and we fit the data um, with a constrained um, N value, then you can determine pretty weak affinities, even down to um, 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 non-specific type of interaction levels. <clears throat> so just to rush through some other applications of calorimetry or ITC in particular, and it's not just about measuring KDs and enthalpy. Um, I said already that um, the integral of um, CP with respect to temperature gives us the enthalpy. Therefore, the delta CP can be determined from the derivative of the variation of the enthalpy with temperature. And so what we need to do is just measure the enthalpy, for example, in an ITC experiment at different temperatures. We can fit that to a linear function. This will give us the heat capacity change for the binding. And unlike the enthalpy or the entropy, the binding help, um, heat capacity change can actually be deconvolved to indicate properties of the ligand binding footprint, such as the change in nonpolar surface area or change in polar surface. If we see a nonlinear function <clears throat> in terms of delta CP, then that may be indicative of coupled events such as um, ligand induced structuring. So we could think about um, natively disordered proteins which um, undergo folding and binding interactions or conformational changes, um, domain movements, folding of some part of our system. This would all be reflected in a relatively large heat capacity of binding and a definite non-linear non-linearity to the delta CP. We've already discussed that we can measure the change in protonation using calorimetry. Here's an example um, published. Um, we can even look at oligomerization or homo um, oligomerization using a dissociation process. So all we do to measure the KD for a dimerization, for example, is providing that the KD is in a micromolar or so range, put the dimer in the syringe and inject it into buffer. And rather than seeing a fixed heat of dilution, what we see is in, um, decreasing amounts of dissociation of the injected um, dimer as we inject it into buffer. You can also think about using this method to look at more complex dissociations, such as heterodimers <clears throat> or even tetramers. Um, there's also an application of using ITC data to look at the kinetics of the binding process during the injection. So ITC is effectively measuring the rate of heat production with this differential power measurement because we're measuring differential power as a function of temperature. And when this um, rate of heat flux becomes slower than the instrumental response time, we can start to extract some kinetic information. If we look at these initial injections in an ITC um, experiment, and then we look at injections which occur later in the experiment, we see that the later ones are significantly broadened. So the kinetics of this recovery of baseline is significantly slower. Um, this becomes because K on becomes slower for the process because of limited free active sites. All of this is implemented in some special software. And if you look at this website or look at this reference here, you'll get a lot more information about this kind of approach to analyzing ITC data. And finally, um, enzyme kinetics can be measured um, with ITC. What you need to do here is um, 
Um, first of all, measure the enthalpy of turnover of your ligand. And in this case, um, we have, have relatively moderate concentrations of enzyme. We look at a fairly long duration. And as we inject in the substrate for the enzyme, we look at complete turnover of the system. So these initial injections give us an enthalpy per mole of substrate turned over. Later on here, we get product inhibition. Um, and so um, it's only these initial points that give us the true enthalpy. Then in another experiment using very low levels, nanomole levels of enzyme, in this case, we do short durations of um, our um, substrate and by doing repeated injections, we increase the concentration of the substrate. And we're looking at the rate of turnover. And we can base that to a rate of turnover per mole um, based on the enthalpy that we measured in the other experiment. And here you can see when you compare ITC data with data obtained with other methods, such as spectrometry, we get very good agreement between the, the rates. Uh, the absolute rates in turn. The interesting thing about this in terms of ITC is in principle, this is very much a walk up technique. We don't need any optical uh, reporter. We don't need to do any assay development or have any coupled reactions that allow us to observe an ends, uh, a kinetic um, enzyme kinetic process. So finally, for just one or two minutes, I just want to tell you a bit about DSC. So I've mentioned this is the instrument we have. Um, it has an active cell volume of about 130 microliters. But in this case, this is working in a robotic system. So we need about 360 microliters to load the cell. Um, it, um, um, we can work at concentrations between 0.2 and an almost unlimited concentration. But typically, we would work somewhere in here between 0.2 and 1 mg per mil. Um, we have a temperature range, as I said earlier, goes above 100, and, uh, 100 degrees C, and we can use a variety of scan rates. And what we can get is um, the thermal stability of um, our system. And we can also determine the enthalpy from integrating the excess differential power um, of the process. When our system underwent a phase transition in the sample cell, we have um, um, an increase in the differential power required to maintain this temperature difference. This can be integrated to give us the enthalpy of the process. So one of the things we can do, and particularly in that this is a, a robotic system, is look at things like uh, thermal shift assays. Here you can see increasing the concentration of this particular ligand for a protein increases its thermal stability. Um, we can also consider looking at um, um, ligands perhaps that bind to the denatured state um, of our uh, protein. So in this case, by adding this cyclodextrin, which binds to exposed um, aromatic groups in the unfolded protein, we actually destabilize the um, melting temperature by adding the ligand. And finally, I just want to mention another interesting application. And this really speaks to the fact that calorimetry um, has so many very wide applications. In this case, somebody had the idea just to do, um, use DSC to study um, human plasma. And human plasma contains hundreds, literally, of proteins. Um, and what they found when they looked at normal human plasma was that the melting uh, or the thermogram or the DSC profile that they saw was actually pretty typical when you took a, a, a number. Here they looked at 15 um, different um, samples of human plasma. And they were able to regenerate this typical melting curve when they looked at the, compos the typical composition of human plasma, and then they did the individual DSC experiments on these proteins. So they measured each protein at the kind of ratio uh, of concentrations that are present in plasma. Um, and um, when they added them together, they recapitulated this normal human plasma um, thermogram. But the interesting thing came was when they looked at plasma 
from patients with a range of different diseases. Um, and these were uh, both um, um, ca um, cancers, but also other types of weird disease. In the yellow here, you can see Lyme's disease. Um, and the idea that the um, authors, this is reported here in, in this paper, and there are a number of papers on this area, but the idea with this is that um, many of the proteins that are present in human plasma are, are in the plasma to bind to small molecules or bind to other proteins. When you have a particular disease, there are biomarkers um, that are circulating in the body, and these may well bind to some of the plasma proteins and through um, mass action effects, they change the stability of these proteins. So all of these shifts into different um, um, diagnostic profiles reflecting lots of different diseases were thought to reflect the fact that um, each disease was associated with this different level of interactome circulating in the, in the circulation system. Okay, just to summarize then, so what I've tried to get across is calorimetry is a label-free and very general method for biological equilibria, it, not just for using on proteins. We can look at nucleic acids, lipids, liposomes, um, vesicles. We can look at pretty well anything. ITC is mainly used for binding. We can extract an equilibrium constant, um, a stoichiometry, an enthalpy, and then we can get other parameters once we've measured these initial values and we can extend it to look at the heat capacity for the process or changes in proteination. PSC is mainly used for looking at phase transitions, thermal stability. We can do measure TM and enthalpy. We can also determine delta CP and we can determine changes in protonation and mechanism and so on. Um, changes in TEM, thermal shift can be used to study ligand binding. And there are many, many other uses of these um, techniques, and I've tried to mention as many as I can um, during the talk. But the big message is that the enthalpy and the entropy that we're measuring, uh, or rather the enthalpy we're measuring, the entropy we're determining, are difficult to interpret. So please don't um, in, um, write them up. Um, in your paper, suggesting a mechanistic interpretation based on a particular enthalpy that you've measured. Um, in isolation, um, they include many, many contributions from lots of different processes, changes in conformation, dynamics, charge, and in particular, changes in water. Here are some uh, papers from work that features calorimetry. Um, that if you review the talk on the YouTube channel, you can have a look at them. And thank you very much. I apologize for again running over and I'm happy to try and address any uh, questions you have in the Q&A. Okay, well, um, so I mentioned that we need to typically, uh, sorry, Veronica has asked how much proteins are required for ITC. Well, typically uh, the the, um, the protein that we're going to put in the cell, we would require around about 350 microliters of a solution, which is around about 20 to 40 micromole in concentration. In terms of what you put in the syringe, which may be another protein, or it may be a peptide, it may be a small molecule, then we would need about 70 microliters of a solution that's 10 to 20 times more concentrated, so 200 to 400 micromole or so. Uh, one of the things about ITC is we can um, perform the experiment in either direction. So for example, <clears throat> if one protein has solubility issues or is difficult to make, you can put that one in the cell where you tend to use slightly less or you require slightly, uh, or you require lower concentrations. Um, so Christina has asked, uh, I will ask the question later by email, fine. Um, and Catherine, what temperature and pressure ranges are typical in your ITC? Um, well, in terms of temperature, we tend to measure um, typically between five degrees C and 37 degrees C. 
Sometimes we're interested in what the affinity is um, at um, body temperature. Sometimes we're worried that our um, samples may go off, so we might consider working at lower temperature. In terms of pressure, we're working at atmospheric pressure. There's no pressurization of the ITC cell. The pressurization, which is only a matter of one or two atmospheres um, um, of pressure, which is applied to the <clears throat> DSC cell. And that is what allows us to go above 100 degrees C. So Ben um, has asked, can liquid liquid phase separated sample give sensible DSC profile? Um, so um, phase transitions um, could be studied um, very easily in an ITC experiment. Um, if one has a way of um, modulating the phase separation process. Um, so that could be if you have a mechanism where you could um, modulate phase separation by, in, by injecting perhaps a, a ligand or changing conditions by injecting, perhaps changing the pH, I'm not sure. Um, whether or not that would give sensible um, data, I am not sure. It would likely give a huge amount of heat. So one would have to probably do a number of experiments where you modulated the heat um, by tuning the concentration. Uh, ben is also asking, which I didn't see, uh, whether DSC could be used to study um, phase separated material. Um, Definitely um, it could be, and one would imagine that as you heat the system up, the phase separation may break down. Um, again, I haven't seen any reports in the literature of people doing this, so I don't know whether it would give sensible DSC data, uh, but certainly it's worth a try. Um, um, would be um, quite interesting. I think the comment about having to modulate the um, amount of material you put in um, would also apply in that uh, biocalorimeters are typically um, have um, some maximum change in differential power that the, the electronics can apply and they're typically tuned for high sensitivity so that that circuitry doesn't um, generate um, can't input unlimited amounts of power. Yeah, interesting question. Yeah, very good. Um, and then Marta is asking, I am doing ITC with fragments and N is uh, around about 0 0.5. Should I assume that my protein is a dimer? In the literature, they said that they assume that it's a monomer. Um, okay. Um, that's quite a difficult question to answer. Um, it, it what it implies is that the component that you have in the cell is only offering half a site to the um, thing that you're injecting into the um, system from the um, syringe. So if the protein um, is uh, a dimer, again, it depends on how you're expressing concentration when you're fitting the data whether you're expressing, expressing it per monomer or in terms of a dimer concentration. It would also depend, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, so, sorry, I'm just laboring this question and not really giving a very uh, concrete answer. When, when you're thinking about ITC data and I talked about the C value for um, ITC titrations, it's quite important that um, you have a look at the data and consider how well constrained the, um, the fitting process is. So what you'll find is that when the C value becomes quite low, um, that the enthalpy and the stoichiometry or the number of sites become convolved together meaning that the fitting software says, oh, I can find one site 
with an enthalpy of 10, or I can find half a site with an enthalpy of 20, or a quarter of a site with an enthalpy of 40. And any of those models have an equal um, um, Lie good least squares curve fit. So if the C value of your titration is low, you may end up getting an artificially low N value. So the way to look at that would be to um, go to the fitting software and put a value of N equal to one and then lock that value during the fitting process and then visually examine the um, data and try and decide um, is the fitting really any better um, if I, um, does the data fit reasonably well? And <clears throat> um, is there an improvement um, or, or a, a loss of quality by um, constraining n equals to one? The other thing that you need to think about, Marta, is also if you don't measure the concentrations of either component accurately, then um, you could also end up generating a reasonably large error in your stoichiometry because what it's reporting is a, uh, effectively a molar ratio. So you're taking two concentrations that you've put into the software when you fit the data um, and then the fit gives you a value for N. Anyway, um, if that doesn't answer your question fully, then I suggest you just email me and I will um, try and uh, elaborate on any specific questions uh, or any additional factors. Um, and finally, um, Veronica has asked, can ITC be used for binding tests between a protein of 90 and a ligand of 400? Um, yes, um, ITC can work on any size of ligand or protein. Um, it has absolutely no reliance on a change in mass, a change in an optical property, um, or a change in physical property um, betw between the free and the bound components. It's me merely a matter that the physical interactions, the non-covalent interactions that are involved in forming a complex generate heat, and that's what we're measuring. So there's no size restriction on um, any of the components. Okay, uh, well, wow, that was great. Thanks very much for the questions. If there's anyone um, still um, holding on listening. Um, and uh, we hope to see you again on um, Thursday for the next um, talk.